Let's go over something I haven't gone over yet is the different types of aircraft that are available, uh, the pros and cons to them. And I'm going to do a full webinar on this, but I just wanted to go over it with you real quick because we're looking to you know, choose your market. So you've got very light jets slash light jets. You've got midsize and you've got heavies. And then you go into the commercial airliner type size. Um, in that if you're looking at you know the pros and cons of each the the light jets typically are owner operators um, they usually will be they can be single pilot uh, which is a big plus for some guys especially for owner operators they can seat usually between four in the cabin all the way up to eight in the cabin once we get above eight uh, we're starting to look into the heavies and so uh, i'll uh, the, the pros you know on that is usually the price point doesn't really go above 10 million and it's just kind of really broad, you know, unless you're looking like brand new, but usually it's 10 million below. Um, and that, and like I said, it's, it can be single pilot, uh, lower cost of maintenance because things are smaller. Although, you know, some people will, will, will make the argument that because things are smaller, if you think about, you know, a computer where all the components have to be, you know, shrunken down to fit into a smaller frame. It's almost more labor because you got to go through a bunch of stuff to, to, to find where, you know, the, the circuit's been hidden. Um, or it's more complicated because things get fused together, just like you see in your iPhones, you know, the smaller they get, you know, if one component goes out, well, now you got to replace the whole like motherboard or whatever it might be. So, but in general, it's a lower cost of maintenance. You know, the engines are not as big, the components are not as expensive. And, and, and that's kind of some of the benefits. It's get, get me from point A to point B. Uh, you're not necessarily sprawling out. You know, I took my family on a, on a Bravo, which has eight seats. We only fit uh, five in the back. And even with the five, like spreading out with luggage and stuff, you know, we felt like it was big enough. But if I had five or six adults in the back, um, it would be a kind of a different story. So you start to kind of feel uh, how small they are, the more people you add to them. The, 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 the heavies are kind of the, the other side of the equation. You know, these are jets that, you know, I'm five foot four. I can, I can stand up comfortably in them. You're still only pretty much a single aisle, uh, but you may have, you know, one of the sides has two, two seats on it. Uh, you may have a, a larger couch. Uh, in there, uh, the bathrooms, there may be multiple bathrooms. Uh, you might have a crew station so that the, 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 the flight attendants are separated from the rest of the cabin. Uh, they have longer range. The light jets are typically limited to about a thousand nautical miles, maybe 1500 nautical miles. So going up and down the coast, it works well. Uh, within a tri-state area, it works well. But if you're going across the country, you're going to need more legs. That's where you get into the heavies. The heavies will go uh, the 22, 2600 nautical miles that is, you know, going across the United States. That's going over the pond. If you need to travel to Europe, you're looking at a heavy jet. You're still going to be limited, you know, eight, ten, maybe twelve passengers. I mean, until you get to the really, you know, a lot bigger ones, um, you're going to start in the heavy jets around four to six to eight million dollars is where you're going to start with your with your acquisition costs whereas with the light jets i mean you can get a light jet for half a million dollars all the way up to like we talked about you know ten million dollars the heavy jets obviously is going to be more expensive to get into uh, they are going to be require a full crew so you're going to need at least two pilots the training for the pilots is going to be more expensive. The maintenance on the heavy jets is going to be more expensive. Um, you know, you're just asking for a bigger asset for a bigger job. Now, from a from a, so so now, if you have the heavies on one side and the lights on another side, if you split the difference, that's where the midsize comes in. The midsize is a more comfortable experience, um, and depending on the midsize that you end up looking at, you could be closer to the you know. Um, you can be closer to the uh, the light jet uh, range where it's still 12 to 1600 nautical miles, but it's a bigger cabin, so it's more comfortable, and maybe they'll have a little bit more speed. You know, bigger engines. They are going to require a two person crew. The the mid size will. Um, and then on the other side, there's something called a super mid that kind of gets you more range. Maybe 2000 nautical miles. Maybe can go coast to coast. Uh, still have more room a little bit. So on the midsize, you have something like an excitation Excel, which is kind of a thinner tube. 
uh, versus something along the lines of a hawker, which is like a bigger circle. And it just feels bigger. It's wider. It has more, it has more space for the cabin. And so people start to feel the difference in the cabins when they get to the midsize. Um, again, we're probably going to be in the two to $4 million range to get started in an acquisition. And then, yeah, we can go all the way up to 10, 15, you know, million dollars plus, uh, when it comes to getting into those and, 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 and you're looking at roughly the, the split, the difference between the maintenance costs. So as a brand new broker, when you're like, well, what market do I get into? I think you look at a couple of things. If you don't have access to a database system like a JetNet or an Amstat, you go to controller and just see what's for sale. Aviation sales is a popularity contest. And so if there's a lot for sale, um, you know, I think there's two ways to look at that either. Okay. There's opportunity because these owners are getting out for some reason. Um, or you look at that and say, well, nobody wants these, nobody's buying them. Now, how are you going to find out? You got to make phone calls. So you call the brokers. Hey, why is he selling? If he's selling because he's upgrading for, to a newer model that tells you, Hey, they like this plane. They just want something different. There's probably somebody else coming up along the way that's going to like this aircraft. Okay. So like I said, the example might be the PC 12s. I think there's almost 20 of them on the market right now. Um, those are fantastic aircraft and usually people are upgrading maybe into a jet, into a midsize or just kind of done with it. You know, it's well known, it's well tracked. And I think that's a, that's a fair market. It's a popularity contest and people want them. So go get one, you know, um, at the same time, you look at something like, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, well, we can look at the citation, uh, ultras. Okay. There's only two of them for sale. Now, what's interesting in there is you might be like, okay, well, there's only two, so nobody wants them. Well, the, the reality is everybody wants them and you can't keep them on the shelves. So again, calling the brokers, hey, why is he selling? Hey, what's the market look like? You know, oh, we're getting a bunch of offers, um, you know, or no one's talking to us or whatever. Maybe you got to talk to the brokers to get the insight on, you know, is this a good market to go into? If you look at something like a Sabre liner, um, there's only one or two available. That one would be an example of, they're just not super popular. They're not super supported. You know, go to go to the forums, go to Reddit, go to Facebook groups for that. You know, type in Saber Liner for sale or, or go into Facebook and type in Saber Liner, you know, owners group. And if there's like nothing there, that would be more of a red flag that like, okay, nobody wants these. These are kind of on their way out. Um, another example would be like a Boeing 737-200. Like there's a bunch of 737s, but they're not a 200 model. Again, you know, there's just not a lot there. So what's great about databases um, is that they, they kind of track these metrics and they give you things like the absorption rate. They give you past sales. And so you can kind of see it graphically, you know, what's available. But you can chart that yourself without having to pay hundreds of dollars uh, a month for the database. So again, find an aircraft that you, that you, that you think you like. Now, a lot of people get attracted to the heavy jets. That's what you see on the music videos on Instagram. I want a Gulfstream, right? Um, something to realize about that, that guy that owns that Gulfstream, a couple things, has probably um, worked with a broker before to get the Gulfstream. Uh, he's probably going to have a lot of gatekeepers between him and you. So you're going to have to go through a lot of gatekeepers. He may have an aircraft manager that you need to speak to or a pilot or whatever it is. And and just because you know you 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 like the Gulfstream doesn't mean it's necessarily a good market. You got to do your market research, like we talked about, by calling the brokers and seeing how popular they are. But as you, you know, Gulfstreams are pretty popular. Um, that would be an example of something that you know, hey, it might be worth it, but it's going to be really hard to get to get into that. So you also have to be like willing to play in that playground. Like people, some people like really they're already, maybe you're already in a situation where you're rubbing elbows with guys who own Gulf streams. Maybe you, you know, have access to, 
you know, you're already doing high net worth sales for automobiles or yachts, or you have an in there. And so you're rubbing elbows with people that are looking for Gulf streams. Well then, okay, that makes sense because you already got people looking, but if you're just coming off the street and you're like, I want to sell a Gulf stream, I probably wouldn't recommend it. I think it's a, a, a little big, too much to bite off. Um, and so look at other things, like consider, you know, a PC 12 where, yeah, there's still like $3 million, um, but it's an owner operator usually or a charter operator. Uh, they're just a different demographic. Citations are, are owner operators or maybe they're uh, executive v VPs that have a company that are, that are using it. And, you know, that's kind of where my comfort zone is. Some people really like working with the midsize because it's somebody in the back, but it's not a heavy jet where, you know, they're, they're going coast to coach or uh, across the, across the Atlantic. And, um, you know, you, you just kind of find a niche there. The other thing to consider is going to be price point, you know, so not just the size of the jet, but the price point that you're dealing with, the higher the price point doesn't necessarily mean the higher the commission. So when you're looking at this, you might be thinking, oh, uh, well, if I sell a $10 million jet, I'll make more money. Not necessarily. Um, the commission might be as much or smaller. And, and I will tell you, those sales cycles for the larger aircraft are usually longer than the sales cycles for the smaller aircraft. And that's because, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. You're dealing with programs now. You're usually dealing with lawyers. We're going back and forth. So to do a heavy jet deal might take you four to six months. Uh, whereas a light jet deal might take you once it's under contract, like a month or two, and then the midsize, you kind of split the difference. So those are a few things to look at when you're trying to consider, okay, what market am I going to go into? And also take a look on controller. You know, if you go into the, into the PC 12s and you see, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess you maybe call it like, you know, ABC aviation and there's 20 listings and they have seven of them. Oh, wow. Like, okay, there's a player that's kind of dominating the market. Um, uh, Rocky Mountain, I think, is one that dominates the SR22 market. So you might see that a market's kind of dominated by a single player. Well, go to their website, check out what they're doing, you know, see their transactions, find out more information. And um, that'll help you, you know, see, oh, can I compete with them? Um, they might be doing something that maybe you can change a little bit and set yourself up to be to be different from them. So that's some things to consider about what markets you want to go into. It would be, you know, consider the dollar amount of the aircraft, the type of demographic that are, that are the owners, their, their mission profile, um, you know, why they have that size of a jet. And, um, you know, I think once you kind of look into that, oh, and how many are on the market, you know, what, what, what are the sales that you're seeing when you kind of dial that stuff in, um, you can find a good market. Now, I would also say, you know, don't get paralyzed by, I need to find the perfect market. There's no perfect market. You have to, you have to dive into a market, find out what's going to, what it's going to take to break through. And then you make that decision. If you're willing to do what it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of work, no matter what, because you're brand new and you got to learn a lot of stuff. And the other thing to consider is when you pick a market, you also want to know the competitors. So if I go into the citation, you know, one uh, citation, the CJ world, I know I'm going to be put up against premieres and put up against phenoms. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. I don't necessarily need to know everything about them and the, uh, the competitors, just know enough about the CJ market because someone's probably going to ask you, what's my CJ worth or what's the market doing there. If you're cold calling someone, they're going to assume you already know about the CJ and they usually don't ask you questions about the CJ because they assume, you know, uh, what they might ask you is, well, I've been thinking about Phenom 100s. What do you know about them? And you can talk and you want to be able to talk intelligently. They may also ask you about the upgrade. So from a CJ to a CJ2 or a CJ4 or, hey, I heard the CJ3 Gen 2 came out. Like what's new there? So it would be helpful to know uh, about it. At the same time, you can still turn it on them and just be like, well, oh, man, that sounds – that's not, yeah, I heard that too. Um, I haven't really looked into it, but be happy to get you some more information on it. And now you have a chance to follow up. So it's not the – I just don't want people to think that like I need to have everything figured out before I choose the right market. And then once I pick a market, I need to figure everything out about the competitors before I even make a phone call. Uh, the goal here is to get people, you know, working towards their goals as soon as possible. So.